It's such a great pleasure again to invite uh, Dr. Crystal van Holt to take us further today. She's going to explain further, and uh, you're so welcome, Crystal. Take it from there. A very, very warm welcome from me. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that you are here. Well-known faces, faces from last year, faces from even before. Two years ago, we were in Slovakia. New faces, I do not take it for granted that you are here. Thank you very much. When I try to prepare something for the introduction of this, as I think, very important conference, my initial thought was, I don't know what to say, everything has been said already. Then when I thought a bit further, I thought, oh, there's so much to say, I don't know how I can cope within my time limits. <laughs> so in the end, I came up with four, uh, with four points to put the um, issues of the conference into a broader perspective and to look at it from a meta level and especially also to see the consequences uh, of certain things going on in our societies in relationship to the next generation, to our children. Marriage, what is marriage and the family? The second one, it's the children who suffer. Do you hear the children crying? The third point, the Archimedean point, which is the firm anchor, the point of reference. That's the transformation of myself, the transformation of my thinking and my heart. And the last point, Creative minorities determine the future. We are a minority here tonight, and I hope very much that we are all part of a creative minority. So the first point, marriage and the family. They are the most foundational building blocks of every society. Marriage is the publicly declared unique sexual union between one man and one woman, husband and wife, based on the difference as well as the mutual complementarity of the two sexes. Marriage is the main link between the sexes, man and woman, and at the same time, the main link between the generations. The family creates a natural connection between the past and the future. The meaning of the German word for marriage, Ehe, is associated with the middle high German word Ehe, which refers to a protected and peaceful space within a community. The historian, sociologist, and unconventional thinker Eugen Rosenstock Hüssi wrote about the anthropology of marriage. He said, Marriage does not only mean one plus one equals one, meaning a new unity through the sexual union of man and woman. Marriage also means one plus one equals infinity through the potential of passing on of life. That's the unique and holistic definition of marriage. Even if this procreation fails in individual cases, there is a fundamental openness in marriage to the future. Grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on. More than 30 years of research confirm that children fare best when reared by their two biological parents in a loving and low-conflict marriage. 
children navigate the developmental stages more easily when raised by their biological mother and father in their natural family. They are also more solid in their gender identity, perform better in academic tasks at school, have fewer emotional problems and become better functioning adults. This is very well established in large number of research over the last 30 years. The leading attachment researchers in Germany, Karin and Klaus Grossmann, they wrote, there are clear differences in the parents' influence on the development of their children. Both parents together, father and mother, lay the foundation for the psychological security and complement each other in the area of secure attachment as well as in the area of secure exploration. Although many marriages fail, of all the possibilities that exist, marriage is able to achieve the greatest level of peace and reconciliation between man and woman, and in turn, between the generations. Not only is the procreation of biological children one of the results of successful married life, a very important additional achievement is passed down to the next generation, a covenant of peace between the sexes. And this peace between a man and a woman significantly influences the worldview of our children and the next generation. My next point. Do you hear the children crying? People do not want to admit that anymore, what I just said. A few examples. The American Psychological Association is the leading professional organization for psychologists in the United States. Its Division 44, the Society for the Psychology of Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity, recently convened a task force on consensual non-monogamy. It wants to promote the social inclusivity of so-called consensual non-monogamous relationships. These, I'm quoting them, include people who practice polyamory, open relationships, relationship anarchy, and other types of non-monogamous relationships. The goal is to take away any stigma or minority stress people in these multi-partner sexual relationships may feel. The APA task force also advocates for non-monogamy as a legally protected class to avoid discrimination, for example, in employment or with regard to state sub subsidies. But what about the plight of the children when their adults are involved in hedonistic sexuality and relationship anarchy? Children do not want numerous adults. They want their mother and their father. In 2017, two German women, lesbian partners, filed a complaint before the European Court of Human Rights. They demanded that the German authorities recognize both of them as mothers. The child was conceived with an ovum, an egg cell, taken from one of the women. The egg cell was in vitro fertilized with a sperm of an anonymous man and then implanted into the uterus of the second woman. So both lesbian women now claimed a biological link to the child. If they do not get what they want, they argued, they are victims of violation of their right to respect for their family life and it would be discrimination against sexual orientation. 
In a recent court case in London, a biological woman who now legally lives as a transgender man became pregnant, has given birth to a child and demands to be entered as father or as parent into the birth certificate of the child, not as mother. The person lost the legal battle so far but wants to appeal, saying that the court ruling breached her human right to respect for family life. Do you hear the children suffer? Isn't in all these cases the child the real victim? Nobody hears their distress and cry. Doesn't every child have an inalienable right to an established filiation with his mother and his father? Charles Socarides was an American psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who pioneered support for individuals who desire to move away from homosexuality. As early as 1994, he wrote, social recklessness brings with it many individual tragedies. As men and women who no longer care for their appropriate sex roles, will create confusion in the very young four generations to come. And he continues in this paper, this movement, referring to the LGBT movement, this movement has accomplished what every other society with very rare exceptions would have trembled to tamper with, a revision of the basic code and concept of life and biology that men and women normally mate with those of the opposite sex and not with each other. The concept of normal, however, is taboo today. The German philosopher Robert Spemann says, the concept of normality is indispensable when it comes to dealing with life processes. Mistakes in this regard threaten the life of humanity. Children grow up with the official view that there is nothing special about the one male, one female unit. It's only one item on the sexual buffet of life. And they feel that they must experiment sexually to discover who they really are. But since there is no real answer to that question anymore, the result will be deep confusion and many broken lives. Educational books and films introduce children into a world that revolves around sex and relationship chaos. Innocent children are being sexualized. They are being taught about sexual practices, promiscuity, sexually transmitted diseases, they are not taught about the values and virtues that make marriage and parenthood possible. Children need warm, intimate, and continuous relationships with their parents. They need emotional bonds, not sex. And it is vulnerable children who are lured into numbing their emotional pain with sex, believing it is love but sex cannot heal their wounds. Children are being taught that they are not only male and female, but more than 100 different genders, gender identities. In the United States, girls as young as 14 can get double mastectomies if they believe they belong to the opposite sex. One of the medical doctors who defends these surgical procedures in minors says, if you want to have breasts later in life, you can go and get them. Is that true? Under the nebulous concept of gender identity, children as young as 11 are receiving injections for gender transition treatment. But there is no blood test, no genetic testing, no brain imaging scan, nothing objective to detect a transgender identity. 
the endocrinologist Michael Laidlaw warns against the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones in minors and points to their serious harm. He rightly says there's no objective test to diagnose a transgender condition, yet we are giving very harmful therapies based on no objective diagnosis. Recently, one of the prominent German newspapers reported about the tragic story of a young man who committed suicide after his sex reassignment. He told his parents and his friends that he was sure he was transgender, and he learned the most about transgender on the internet and through internet chats. He became convinced that he was trapped in the wrong body. His therapist also was convinced that sex reassignment was the right thing for this young man. He supported him on the path of change to change his sexual characteristics. The young man took estrogen and then had reassignment surgery. But after the second surgical procedure, he was 25 years at that time, he committed suicide. And only after his death, his parents found his diary. And what they read shocked them so much that they were ready to publish their story anonymously in the paper. The diary showed a highly sensitive, profoundly insecure boy who often felt marginalized and had the feeling of not being good enough as a man. In his diary, he also described his doubts about wanting to live as a woman. He wrote that although he often wished to be a girl, there were also times where he was satisfied being a man. And shortly before his tragic death, he wrote, I hate myself deeply for what I have done. With all my strength, I wish I was a man again. I want to have a girlfriend, become a father, and have a family. That brings me to my third point, the Archimedean point, the firm anchor, the, fo the point of reference. What can we learn from this tragic story? Martin Buber, a leading Jewish philosopher of the 20th century wrote, the Archimedean point from which I can change the world from within my location is the transformation of myself. Everything begins with myself. Change does not begin by changing structures. It does not start by trying to change others. It begins by changing myself. There are no superficial solutions. Eye drops cannot be administered with a watering can. Only eye drops, however, can heal the eye. Only through sensitive, careful, and knowledgeable attention to each individual who seeks counsel can there be changes. And first, a change in my own thinking and heart is needed. We all have to face reality. We have to face our tendency not to want to see the truth. We have to face our tendency to not want to see how others struggle and are left alone in their anguish and pain. The story of this young man who committed suicide shows us it's not about accusing anyone. The important thing is that we notice the possible hardness of our own heart. Often we are tempted to seek quick, painless solutions, but they do not exist, neither for the counselor nor for the one who seeks counseling. But the good news is, of course, we are all here to learn from one another and especially from the experts who are here and I am very thankful for each of you who came. What we are lecturing here at this conference is not quackery. All content is based on solid, proven, and scientifically sound foundations. 
Just a short example, in August 2019, a new genetic study on same-sex sexual behavior was published in the prestigious journal Science. It's the most extensive study to date with a sample of nearly half a million individuals, men and women, and it confirms there is no gay gene. It confirms basically what we know already from, from large twin studies, which is genetic contributing factors are minor, postnatal, very individually experienced environmental factors are major. So during the conference, we will present sound information based on science, on long-standing experience, and on research. And that brings me to the last point. Creative minorities determine the future. We may sometimes ask ourselves whether our endeavors are worth it. There are so many challenges that we face today. Can we still achieve anything? Is it really true that creative minorities determine the future? We all who are here, whether somebody seeks support or whether somebody gives support, we all here are part of this creative minority. We need each other. There is a wonderful symbolic narrative, the Druid, by Jeremias Gotthelf. He is a Swiss writer who lived in the 19th century. The story takes place in pre-Christian times. A Swiss tribe migrates to Gaul in search of a better life and more wealth. As they ask for permission to enter the land, they are ambushed and have to fight for their lives. Many are killed. In the end, they return to their homeland, impoverished and starving. Only one grandfather and one child had remained at home, faithful to their homeland and their heritage, despite all the begging and protesting from their relatives. The grandfather and the child sowed and harvested, and in this way had preserved the precious grain, a prerequisite for life. They knew they could not just put the grain in a drawer and set it aside for a later time. You have to sow it regularly and regularly harvest so that it stays alive and viable. The grandfather and the child also took care of the equipment. In ordinary, everyday life, they remained true and faithful to their heritage and mission. When the others came back, the grandfather and the child were able to welcome them hospitably and make a fresh start possible for them in their home. Now one can interpret this story in many ways. It can be interpreted as to be about a culture that turns its back on its cultural roots and pursues an ideology that promises a better life, sexual liberation, but ends up in manifold captivity. And are there still people who, figuratively speaking, remain at home? Judith Butler, she is a leading philosopher of gender ideology. She says in an interview, many people argue that we should all feel at home in our bodies. She continues, however, that she herself does not believe in that. And she also says it does not apply to herself. Feeling at home in our bodies. In Search for Identity as Man and Woman is the title of our conference. Is it not precisely about people finding rootedness in their bodies as well? Are not our bodies places where we can be at home? Places from which we can provide nourishment for others, as well as places 
from which we shape the future. In Eastern Europe, you have experienced the fall of totalitarian regimes. Václav Havel, who was the former president of Czechoslovakia, said, where the truth comes to light, there is freedom. This is what the IFTCC is about, the struggle for truth and freedom. It was just a grandfather and a child, a very small minority, but they ultimately determined the future of the Swiss tribe. Does this story reveal a universal truth? I leave the conclusion to you. I'm really looking forward to the time that we will have together.